Okay, recording is on. Welcome back, everyone. We are continuing with our lecture on interpreting scripture. And uh, we're looking at some uh, examples on um, scripture passages in the New Testament that are referencing Old, Old Testament scripture. And we're just trying to apply uh, what we have learned in going about interpreting these passages. So we're looking right now as an example, um, Galatians chapter 4, verses 22 to 31. We just read this passage uh, in the previous lecture. And um, we said that in this passage, uh, the Apostle Paul is making a, a, a reference to many Old Testament things. First of all, he's referencing many characters and places. Uh, he's referencing Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Hagar, Sarah. Although he doesn't mention uh, Sarah's name here uh, specifically, but he references her. And then he references places like Mount Sinai, earthly Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem. And then he is teaching us, he's teaching us New, Te New Testament revelation. So we want to understand how do we interpret this passage? What is What should we learn? What is the message that we should get in the New Testament? So to do that, the first thing we said is we need to understand the context in which all of this is written. So would uh, you know we just leave it open to the class? Uh, what is the context? What do you think is the context mm, uh, in which this passage sits? What is the context? Anybody? We can have a few people share your thoughts? Old content and new content. Yes. So the Apostle Paul is contrasting Old and New Covenant, yes. What else? Any more? Any other thoughts? So what is the context of um, the epistle to Galatians? Any thoughts? I, I know, you know, we haven't studied um, Galatians as a whole episode, so it's a little early to ask, but still, you know, uh, uh, those of us who have read through Galatians would have some idea. Uh, what is the context? New Testament is spiritual, refers to spiritual matters, whereas Old Testament refers to physical things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. First, so I, I think in this, Paul is encouraging the Christians or the believers in the Church of uh, Galatia to uh, to live uh, to live in the Spirit, to grow in the Spirit, to come out of the uh, to to see beyond the laws or the, mm -hmm. the old covenant, and uh, is encouraging them, saying that there is more uh, in Jesus, mm -hmm. and to be free and not to be bound uh, bounded by uh, I think it's uniquely to them by uh, the constraints of the law. So don't be, don't live life too legalistic way. Just look beyond it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a freedom in the spirit, freedom in Christ. So I think that's um, what he's getting at. Mm -hmm. And then he's using this sim sim uh, symbolically in a way. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Hegar's uh, Ishmael also represents flesh. And so it's not encouraging. In a way, living by the law could also be be seen as living in the flesh. So um, that's some of the things that I can get off of. Just, you know, mm. So. Mm. Right. Right. Good. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? On the context in which this passage is given. Right. So... The context, uh, if you look at the immediate context, uh, chapter four context, and then the larger context in which um, the whole episode of Galatians. So if you look at the context of Galatians, uh, as uh, Roshan pointed out, the purpose of writing this episode was uh, so he's writing to uh, believers in Galatia, and if uh, if you get a little background to uh, uh, to what was going on, uh, Paul in his first missionary journey, 
he had traveled through the region of Galatia. So it, it included, um, so there's just little background information. Okay. It's not, it's not like you have to know it, but it's good to know it. He traveled through uh, the Tri-City uh, tri area, uh, Lystra, Derby, Iconium. They were all part of uh, this region of Galatia. It's like a district. Yeah? So we would say Bangalore district or, you know, whatever. Um, so the, the district of Galatia had many cities. And the cities that he went through were these three were close to each other. So he journeyed through, he preached the gospel. These people believed in Jesus, you know. And then he went, Paul went back to Antioch. Now, right after he finished his first missionary journey, there were these Hellenistic Jews or these Jews from Jerusalem who went on the same trail. They took the same route and they confused these new believers. They said, no, no, you all have to follow the law. You have to follow the law. It's not enough to believe in Jesus. You have to keep the law. So these people were so confused because they decided to believe in Jesus. And now these Jewish leaders are coming and saying, you have to keep the law. And so they are, so they are so confused. They are drifting back to keeping the law. So that's, that's what Paul right, mentions these people. You know, he mentions them in chapter two and verse four. He says, you know, false brethren, they came, chapter, Galatians 2, 4, he said, they came to spy out our liberty which we have in Jesus Christ and to bring us again into bondage. So he calls them false brethren. So he says, these people came, they came to spy out the freedom we have and to bring, bring us back into bondage to keep the law. So that's the whole issue. So that's the background, right? So he's writing to these new believers in Galatia who are now sliding back to keeping the law. And his whole thing is to help them understand that in Jesus Christ, we are not obligated to keep the law, but we are called to a life in the spirit, which is what he brings out in chapter five. Like, and you know, kind of Roshan has pointed out. So that's the context. So in while he is trying to explain to them about uh, this whole uh, 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 difference, in chapter three, he has used this, uh, 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 what to say, uh, a picture of a tutor and a student. So in chapter three, previous chapter, he said the law was given like a tutor to bring us to Christ. And once we came to Christ, that, that is no longer needed. The law is no longer needed. So he uses that picture in chapter three. Uh, verses 23 onwards, 23, so on. So he uses that picture. Uh, the law was given like a tutor to bring us to Christ, to faith in Christ. Once we have faith in Christ, that, that is no longer, it's it served its purpose. But in chapter 4, this passage which we read, he's using another uh, picture. And this is where he starts referencing Old Testament. Old Testament characters. Now he's already mentioned Abraham in chapter three and, you know, the seed of Abraham. He's already mentioned, you know, he's already used that uh, in chapter three. Chapter four, he's again using some more Old Testament characters, right? So what is the context? Context is I have to help people see that you're not under the law, but you're free from the law in Christ. And you have to don't go back to the law, but you have to move forward in the spirit. That's the context. So in order to do that, one of the things he's doing is he's referencing Old Testament characters. So now we should try to understand. So that's the context. Now next step. Who are the Old Testament characters and what is he trying to bring out? So he's starting over with Abraham. Abraham, Hagar, Sarah, or Sarah and Hagar. Through Sarah, there was Isaac. Through Hagar, there was Ishmael. And then he, he's continuing this two, basically like two trains of thought. 
uh, or two contrasting pictures using Old Testament characters. So uh, I think uh, both uh, Brother Manavar and Roshan mentioned, Ishmael refers to the natural, the flesh. Isaac, he says, refers to the promise. So that's verse 24, Galatians 4, 24, two symbolic things. So he's drawing that parallel. And then he says, um, uh, Isaac, then he says, so the, the natural one is promise. The other one is promise. Then he says, Mount Sinai. What happened to Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai is the place where the law was given and earthly Jerusalem. But then he says there is heavenly Jerusalem in contrast to that. So one is a line of promise, one is a line of the natural law bondage. Promise makes us children of promise and there is this heavenly Jerusalem uh, place of promise. So he's drawing that thing. But having done this, what does he do? What is his message then? What is the conclusion? of what having done, drawn this contrast, what is he concluding? Or what is the revelation we need to take from this passage as New Testament believers? So we understand the characters and all of that, but what is he concluding here for us? I think uh, you've already mentioned it, but you could say it again. Uh, what is the conclusion here? Anyone? Now, what are some of the things he says? So, we are children of the promise. That is verse 28. So, he's saying, look, he's telling the, these, you know, so think about this. He's telling these Jewish believers, who are we? Verse 28, we brethren, as Isaac, are children of promise. So that's what he wants to get to. So he's saying, don't take your identity through Hagar, Ishmael, Mount Sinai, which is the law, or earthly Jerusalem. We are children of promise. So we have come through Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Heavenly Jerusalem, children of promise. We come along that lineage, children of promise. So we are not under Mount Sinai. We are not under the law, but we are through Isaac. We are children of promise. Then he says, verse 31, he repeats, we are children. We are not children of the bond woman, but of the free. So bond woman, that was Hagar. We are not descendants of Hagar. We are through the promise, that is, through Sarah. We are, so he repeats that again in verse 31. So that's the revelation, that's the truth. He's trying to get to these believers, uh, Jewish believers. So you don't have to keep the law. It's not under Mount Sinai. It's under the heavenly Jerusalem. It's a place of promise. And while he's drawing this, this is the spiritual truth he wants the New Testament believers to understand, which you and I will understand, right? That we are children of promise. So while he's doing this, he also shares some other things for us. He says, verse 29, he says, look, there is a conflict here, conflict going on. What is a conflict? What is born of the flesh, that's the natural, is persecuting or it's opposing, it's going against what is birthed according to the spirit. So there's this conflict between the natural and the spiritual. Just like how he referenced, you know, Hagar and uh, Ishmael and Isaac, Hagar and Sarah, there was conflict there. It says here also there's conflict, the natural, the spiritual. So that's another thought for us to keep in mind. And we can build on that to understand that the natural opposes the spiritual. But we are children of the spiritual. Now we have we have to contend against the, the natural. But now he quotes two Old Testament passages. That's in verse 27, he's quoting from Isaiah 54. 
and then in verse 30 he's quoting from Genesis 21 and we can see the cross reference in many of our Bibles we can see that right so what is he telling us why is he quoting those passages here and what do those two passages mean for us when it's quoted here in the Old Testament so we understood the characters and the places so what they mean for us now we want to understand the two references he's quoting uh, that is Isaiah 54 and Genesis 21 what do they mean for us? what's he trying to get to us through those two quotations anyone Feel free to share your thoughts. It doesn't have to be right. right? We're all learning, so it's okay if uh, you know you say something. As you know, it's okay. Just just whatever thoughts are. Uh, what what can we take from those two references? Is the scripture text he's quoting? He's quoting it in this context, so we have to interpret those passages in this context, the New Testament context. So try and do that. So let's look at it. Verse 27. Who do you think he has in mind when he says, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear? Who do you think he has in mind? Whom is he talking about? So we have two women, Hagar and Sarah. And he's quoting Isaiah 54. We, who do you have in mind? I think Sarah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, right? So, because he's talking about Sarah, because Sarah was barren, who never gave birth, right? So, Isaiah 54 is being quoted in this passage, and in this context, he has already set the stage, right? He has referenced two Old Testament characters, which is Hagar and Sarah, and Sarah has been barren. But Sarah is representing for us the line of promise, the children of promise, Sarah, Isaac. And he says, we are children of the free woman. We are children of the promise. And so in the context, in that context, referencing Sarah, he's saying, rejoice, so barren, you who did not bear, for more are the children of the desolate. And he's saying, we are children of the promise that is Sarah so spiritually that's the so he's using Isaiah 54 to refer to both Sarah and to us we are those children whom he says more are the children of the desolate so Sarah is the one who was buried she was the one who was desolate but look we are children of the promise we are the children that God has blessed that lineage of promise people of the heavenly Jerusalem. So that's what he's using. So that's how we understand his quotations of the Old Testament. He's actually talking about Sarah. He's talking about us. And then he quotes from Genesis 21. And he says, in Genesis, uh, this is verse 30, cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir but the son of the free woman. What's he trying to get at? Over there, verse 30. So, walk in the freedom of the uh, New Testament, mm, mm. in the traditions of the world. Correct, correct. So, so he's quoting this text from the Old Testament. Of course, he's talking about Sarah and Ishmael. But he's, he's quoting very strong words. What was his words? The words was, cast out the bondwoman and her son. What does the bondwoman and her son represent? It's the law. It's Mount Sinai. He says, cast out. So, 
you know, for the Jewish believers, he's, it's very, it is coming through very clear. Oh, just as God had instructed the cast out, many get rid of, send away the uh, Hagar and Ishmael, the born woman and her son, send away. So we also, we are children of promise, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, heavenly Jerusalem. But what was, what was we do? Well, just like what happened in the Old Testament, they sent away the born woman and her son, Hagar and Ishmael, representing Mount Sinai. We also must put that away because we are children of promise. We don't live under the law. We are living under the spirit. So the message is coming through very clearly for these Jewish believers. They will understand, you know, they, they've heard all this. They know all this. And for them, it, it is a very strong message saying, hey, no longer under the law, you're under the spirit. Right? So uh, this is, you know, uh, and then he goes on into chapter five, where he just makes it plain, says, stand fast in the liberty where the Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage, chapter five, verse one, right? So, uh, it, you know, it is so nice to see, uh, I mean, it's so beautiful to see how uh, the Holy Spirit is, is, is given, of course, is given Paul the apostle, the revelation to use these Old Testament characters, to use an Old Testament incident. So the incident actually happened. You know, Abraham, so there was conflict between Sarah and Hagar, and um, uh, Abraham had to send Hagar and Ishmael away, right? So the Apostle Paul is using all of that in this context to get a message across to these Jewish, new Jewish believers in Jesus that they don't have to keep the law. They don't have to live under the law. They don't have to come in bondage to the law. We are not children of the bond woman, but we are free. We can live in the spirit. So just so beautiful how he, you know, how the Old Testament is being used in the New Testament to bring about revelation of the New Testament. Okay? And then uh, it points us back to a better understanding of the Old Testament as well. So here's an example of, we remember in one of the chapters, we talked about types and shadows and illustrations. So here's one example of an illustration, right? Where something in the Old Testament is being used in the New Testament uh, and is bringing out meaning, is bringing out spiritual truth for us in the New Testament. Okay, it's a beautiful example. Uh, everybody understood? Everyone, everyone is with me so far? Any questions? Okay. All right. So we just did two examples. So like this, you know, there are many examples in the New Testament where the Old Testament is quoted. You know, you will find this in the Gospels, uh, concerning the ministry, <clears throat> ministry of Jesus. You'll find it in Paul's epistles. Uh, you'll find it in the book of Hebrews, uh, where a lot of reference is made to the Old Testament. And you'll also find it in end time scripture, that is in Revelation, uh, and as well as other, uh, you know, scriptures. So in the New Testament is referencing back to um, the book of Daniel, uh, when, it, when they're talking about end times, right? So we'll have those quotations as well. So um, uh, there's a lot of uh, quotation in the New Testament concern the old from the old testament on various various things and and uh, you know uh, uh, we're just getting some understanding on how to interpret and apply those truths i want to move now to the next chapter it's chapter or the next topic that i just want to speak about and i'll give you the notes on this uh, i will put it up in the classwork um, and this has to do i want to talk a little very briefly about applying the scripture scripture scriptural application right so the whole purpose here is uh, for us uh, in, in in biblical interpretation in in learning about interpreting scripture yes uh, for us to apply the scripture in our lives right so that means 
personally, right? Uh, we have to apply it. And uh, then also many of us are have the responsibility to of leading others. So we have to make sure that we interpret correctly. For what reason? Of course, we want to understand it correctly, but ultimately we want to apply it correctly, right? So um, keep this in mind, keep this in mind, that the Bible, if it is misinterpreted, it can result in misapplication. And misapplication of the scripture can sometimes result in uh, uh, dire consequences. Okay, think of this simple example. Somebody will take a scripture. Somebody take a, a scripture. They will take chapter and verse. Jesus said, if any man will follow me, he must hate his father and his mother, his wife, his children, son and daughter, and come and fall, take up his cross and follow me. So, you know, either somebody can read that verse and say, hey, Jesus said, I must hate everybody. I must follow him. Hate all my family, father, mother, wife, children, take my cross, follow him. Or somebody can preach a message. See, if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to hate your father and mother, brother and sister, and follow wife and children, follow Jesus. Now, that is a, that is a true scripture. It is in the Bible. It is exactly what Jesus said, right? Um, um, Matthew, I think it's Matthew 14, verse 26. You know, Jesus said, Matthew 14, uh, not Matthew, Luke. I'm, I'm looking at Luke and I'm saying Matthew. Luke 14, 26. Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Matthew 14, 26, 27. Okay, this is scripture. Somebody can read it or somebody could preach a message from it and say, so you have to hate your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, follow Jesus. Now, misinterpretation can be leave them, leave them all, just abandon your family, come and follow Jesus. Misinterpretation. Misapplication, some married man, he has his parents, uh, he has a wife, he has his children. He abandons all of them. So, okay, see, I love Jesus more than all of you. You take care of yourselves. I'm going. And he leaves them and he follows Jesus. What will happen? People will suffer. But he can base it on scripture. He can say, well, I'm obeying Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. I'm obeying those verses. But what has happened? It has been misinterpreted, misapplied, and somebody or some people are going to face problems. Right? And this, this is just, you know, giving a simple example. Uh, so how would we, how should we interpret, you know, Luke 14, 26, 27? I mean, just, I'm sure all of us know it already, but just for, uh, for a little discussion here. How should we interpret Luke 14, 26, 27? And Jesus said, if you, if you do not hate your father and mother, what does that mean? How would we help people understand it correctly? Anyone? Just go ahead. Feel free to share.
Silatoli, what do you think? According to you, my understanding is that uh, we need to love God first and then put our family second and do the will of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. But is it right for somebody to, you know, like a married man who says, hey, I'm just going to leave my wife and children and brothers, sisters, father, mother, and going, I'm following Jesus and doing is it a right application? Uh, uh, how would we speak to someone like that? What else can we tell some person like that? Anyone? Okay. Yeah, I agree with Silatoli and I see Brother Maho's uh, comment in the chat. We have to love God more than anyone else, right? So what do we have to do is, okay, Luke 14, 26, 27 is there, but scripture must be interpreted in the light of the rest of scripture. We can't take these two verses in isolation. So our question is, what else is given to us in scripture, right? What else does the New Testament teach? Does the New Testament really tell that, you know, a man must abandon his wife and children and parents and just go? No. What else do you see in the New Testament? Well, you also see in the New Testament things like, you know, a husband must love his wife. Yeah, Ephesians 5, and Colossians 3. Husband, you have to love your wife. You have to nourish and cherish her. And then um, fathers, you have to care for your children, Ephesians 6. You have to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So that's a responsibility. And in fact, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, it's a very strong verse. 1 Timothy 5, 8, he says, you know, uh, a believer must provide for his own house. And if he doesn't provide for his house, 1 Timothy 5, 8, he is worse than an unbeliever. Right? So we have all these other scriptures also. So we can't take Luke 14, 26, 27 in isolation. You've got to interpret it. You've got to understand it in the context of all the other scriptures. So as, as uh, both of you have correctly shared, it means that practically we have to love God above everything else and everyone else, love him uppermost, then also fulfill our other responsibilities. As a husband, you love your wife, you nurture your children, you provide for your household, because it's all there in the rest of the New Testament. And you love God, love the Lord more than in anyone else. And you're willing to you know, follow him, obey him, uh, while you are also obeying the rest of the things he's told us in scripture concerning uh, family are concerning taking care of our wife and children, right? So scripture must be interpreted in the light of the rest of scripture. That means all the other things must also be brought to bear on the same subject. And then we interpret it and then we apply it, right? So we should never take something in isolation and just go off on that. No, you take the scriptures and say, okay, what does the other scripture say? Or in relation to this, then you are, you know, interpret it, then we apply it. So in the application, so the point, the first point I want us to understand is, if scripture is misinterpreted, it will lead to misapplication, which can then, in some cases, have uh, quite a uh, bad outcomes, it can cause problems, you know. So we have to be very, very careful, right? That's why interpreting scripture uh, correctly is important so that we can apply it uh, correctly. And we can think of many examples, many examples where uh, uh, scripture has been misinterpreted and therefore it has been misapplied and then people get into problems.
The second thing in application is, and these are some things we've already you know, spoken of, but I'm just kind of bringing it all together here when you're talking about application is, we should always understand progressive truth, right? And we must apply present truth or we must live in present truth. And I think it's uh, over in, uh, let me give you the exact word, Second Peter. Yeah. Uh, Second Peter, um, chapter one, verse 12. Could somebody read Second Peter one, verse 12, please for us? Peter one twelve. Uh, maybe I'll type it in the chat here. Can read that for us? Go ahead. Second Peter one verse twelve. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth. You will not. What is the last part of that verse again uh, in your version? Present uh, established? Uh, firmly established uh, in the truth you now have. Okay. So, NIV. okay, NIV. All right. So, so the NIV says, you are firmly established in the truth you now have. The New King James says, you know and are established in the present truth. It means the same thing, but this the present truth sounds nice i think <laughs> uh, he's talking about truth you have now or present truth so that's the second point um, which we have est 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 uh, established before that is in the bible revelation is progressive that means the light keeps getting brighter and brighter in the scriptures Right. So as you go from Genesis all through the New Testament, the light gets brighter and brighter. And what are we to do? We must live in the truth we now have or in the present truth. That means in the New Testament. Right? What has God revealed to us all the way in the New Testament, in the written scriptures? I'm not talking about things that people make up in these days. I'm talking about in the scriptures. What is God revealed in the scripture, the present truth? We have to live in that. So that's another important thing to understand. So if somebody is quoting from the Old Testament or is quoting, you know, any scripture, anything, we must ask ourselves, see, I must apply present truth. So on that subject, what is the progressive revelation? What does God continue to unveil in the Holy Scriptures by which I must live? Right? And we saw this example. Then we saw those guidelines about temporary and permanent, about culture. When God is speaking to a certain culture, those things were temporary. It was for them in that place. But then there were certain things that were permanent. So what has happened? There are some things that continue through time, and there are some things that God has uh, changed over time and said, this is what you must do now. Example, keeping of the Sabbath. So if somebody um, quotes from the Old Testament, oh, you have to keep the Sabbath. They can start in Genesis chapter 1 and say, God kept the Sabbath. He hallowed the Sabbath. So we had to keep the Sabbath. And then he gave it as a law, the Ten Commandments. He gave it as, you know, so we have to keep the Sabbath. Okay. But what is progressive revelation? What does the New Testament say about the Sabbath? The principle applies. What is the principle? Have a day to rest and worship God. That's the principle. But the New Testament tells us that we do not observe Sabbaths. This is in Colossians chapter 2, right? I'll give you the exact verse and just as a reference. 
uh, when you come to Colossians chapter 2 and uh, uh, verse 16, Colossians 2, 16. Let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. And he goes on in that, in that passage. Colossians 2, 16, 17. So what is present truth? What is the truth we now have? The truth we now have is nobody is going to judge me on observing you know, on the food and drink and festival and new moon and Sabbaths. That's the present truth, the truth we now have. Of course, somebody can quote Genesis 1. Somebody can quote Exodus 20 saying you have to obey the Sabbath as 10 commandments. But then what is the truth we now have? No, let no one judge you concerning Sabbaths. So what must we apply or what must we apply to ourselves and what must we teach people? Present truth, the truth we now have, right? So that's the second thing, right? If we are not careful, we could quote scripture. We could take up chapter and verse. But when we tell people to apply, we have to tell people to apply present truth, truth we now have that is given to us on that matter. Okay, so application must be based on present truth. What is, because progress, revelation is progressive, what did God say now? The third, a uh, couple of other thoughts here on, on application of scripture is uh, stay with what is well understood and do not let obscure and difficult passages become more important than what is clear and obvious and definite. So third act thing. In application. I will give you the notes, but I'm just saying. Stay with what is clear and definite. And don't fight about and don't try to go off on passages and scriptures that are obscure, that are maybe not very clear, not very easy to understand, and start fighting about those things. So, example. In Job, the book of Job, what did Satan do to Job? He came and he smote him and all of those things. God took a hedge of protection. You know, he told, you know, you've got a hedge of protection. So God told Job, yeah, yeah, okay, he's in your hands, go. And uh, Satan attacked Job. Now, do we understand everything? That, I mean, what is, why did God take off the hedge of protection to let Job go attack and all those things? You know, we may not have all the answers to that. But... Don't, don't break your head about it. Don't worry about that. Because you and I are not disciples of Job. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. And we are living by the New Testament. What is clear in the New Testament? Very clear in the New Testament. Jesus Christ conquered the devil. So I'm not worried about Job and his struggles. And how did God take off that hedge of protection? And how why did God let Satan afflict Job, then I'm not worried about it. Uh, I may have answers to it, but let's not fight about it. Very clear in the New Testament. On the cross, Jesus conquered Satan. Jesus disarmed principalities and powers. He has given us authority, and the God of peace will crush Satan underneath our feet. And he has given us weapons of our warfare, but are mighty through God. He has given us the shield of faith, which will quench every fiery dart of the wicked. So I will live by that truth. That truth tells me I can quench every fiery dart of the enemy. It is very clear in the New Testament that Satan is subject to me. I'm not afraid of him troubling me the way he troubled Job. So 
So we don't try to live by what happened to Job. We live by what is clear, what is very definite in the New Testament. So I'm just giving one example where people can get so worried about Job. What happened to that hedge of protection? What, you know, why are you worried about all that? What is, uh, I mean, if you want, you can study out of interest and we can discuss, okay, but what do we live by? What is the application that we must apply? What does the New Testament say about the believer? The believer has complete protection. The Bible says, 1 John 5, 18, 19 says that if we abide in Christ, that wicked one cannot touch us. That is New Testament teaching. That is very clear. No questions on it. We must live by that. That's what we apply. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The Bible says, you know, give no place to the devil. That is very clear in the New Testament. So we live by that. So there may be some passages that we can't understand that, that have some questions we may not be able to answer. But we don't live by those things. We live by what is clear, definite, and we practice that. Is that okay? Uh, there are some more thoughts on this. I will share it uh, next week. When we talk about application, how do we apply scripture correctly? Keep these simple truths in mind. Okay. Any questions? Uh, there are some more things which we will cover next week. I'm just stopping now because uh, time is almost over. Are you all with me so far? Okay. All right. Any questions before we close in prayer and dismiss? Okay. Fine. So let's take a moment. Let's uh, uh, pray together and then we will close. Dismiss. Okay. Um, may I request somebody to just uh, pray with us and we will dismiss. Anybody can pray. Okay. Let me call somebody. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these teachings. Help us, Lord, that we will be established in these precious teachings and we'll be strong in you. Lord, when various Deceptions come. We will be strong in you, Lord. We will be able to face you, knowing the truth of your gospel, understanding, interpreting the scriptures correctly. Mm. Lord, by doing this, we may be saved. And we may also save those who hear us. Mm. Lord, we give you all the glory. We thank you, Lord, for this teaching. Bless Pastor for repeating this truth to us. Help us, Lord. Whatever we have heard today, it may remain in us. And we may go by this truth in our life and live a victorious Christian life in this world. And be your true children and true witnesses. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I will see you again next week. God bless. Bye now.